Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and today it's time to get really pissed off over minor inconveniences because we're gonna be talking about our favorite shortmen, the dwarves. I'm gonna be talking about the lore of the dwarves as well as their fifth edition sub races, and I'm gonna try to do it without spontaneously breaking into a Scottish accent. Fun fact, I can't actually do a Scottish accent, it always ends up Indian. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this video is just my opinion, so if you feel like your beard is thicker than mine, feel free to leave a comment down below. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So long ago, there was this god named Moradin. Moradin was a master crafter capable of creating incredible works of art whether they be statues, weapons, armor, or anything else that could be molded through metals, gems, and fire. Eventually, he decided to create his own physical self-representation, and so he crafted living beings out of metal and gems, and cooled the fires of their hearts with his own breath. He gifted these creatures souls and gave them their very own name, Dwarves. These dwarves, like their father, decided that rocks were really cool, especially when you hit them with other rocks, and so they took up Morden's profession of extreme rock collecting in order to get Daddy to notice them. Their entire lives actually revolve around mining, smithing, and crafting works of art that they hope will come close to Morden's perfectionist standards. Dwarf crafts are noticeably way better than most other crafts, just due to how serious the dwarves are about it. They guard their projects like they're crafting their own children, just like Morden, and a dwarf's life can be measured in how numerous and how well made their work was. This mental state of gotta work 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 led into their societal lives by making them highly devoted to stability, repetition, and tradition, so no dwarf is gonna reinvent the wheel, and if it ain't broke, make it again and again and again and again. Of course, it's this mindset that spawns one of the dwarves' incredibly annoying traits, which is their unwillingness to change their minds about things, and by extension, their immense grudges that spend centuries and generations. It all serves them well in the end, however, since great minds think alike, and a dwarf's best relationship is to the members of their own clan. Everything they do, all of the troubles that they go through, all the works of art they create, everything trickles down to being a means to bring more honor and glory to their clan. A clan is made up of a dwarf's extended family, and no matter how far that blood thins, the connection doesn't waver one bit, as a dwarf would throw its head on a blade for even their father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate if that roommate was a part of the same clan. Dwarf life consists of three main types of jobs, all in service to the clan. The first type of job helps the community by making food, drink, and the like. The second type focuses on crafting amazing works of art for the clan to use, such as arms and armor, and the third type of job is to go out and interact with all the strange tall folk of the land so that they can keep up good diplomatic relations with their surrounding neighbors, usually for the purposes of making sure that, in case of danger, someone else will get attacked first and the clan will have time to close up shop. Speaking of which, if for some reason you don't already know this, dwarves are very fond of building their fortresses and strongholds inside of the bellies of giant mountain ranges, like the world's most bearded ants. Given the dwarves' articulate nature, these strongholds are absolutely breathtaking works of art that would stun any outsider that lays eyes upon it. Stonecutters and architects work in tandem to create intricate stone carvings that not only look fantastic, but actually serve to be a retelling of that clan's lengthy history, telling battles won, dwarves honored, and stones cut for the glory of the clan. And no dwarf is more glorious than the king, queen, and royal nobles that lead a clan and stronghold in their efforts to maintain, defend, and expand their riches and family ties. These dwarves can trace their noble lineage back to the original dwarves dwarves that were first blown by Moradin, and their skill in leading is forged the way all things are forged, with patience, care, and a lot of molding. Dwarven nobles, when they're first growing up, are required to apprentice under a master of every single profession that the clan can provide, and this is done for two reasons. The first is so that the noble child can better understand the people that it intends to lead, understanding how difficult each job is, and how common dwarves live their lives, so that the noble neither becomes too lethargic in its own comfort, nor hand waves the troubles of those who are not as fortunate as them. The second purpose is so that the common people can better understand the noble that intends to lead them, creating a much tighter bond within the community and making it much easier to assess where exactly the noble strengths in leading would be, whether it be as a war minister or even as an artisan overseer. Truly, every bit of dwarven life is set on a specific track crafted by the dwarves that came before, but there are variations in the types of dwarves that you'll see based on where the dwarves settle. So let's take a minute to look at all the various stats of the dwarves! First of all, every dwarf from the littlest dwarf to the almighty dwarfen beard gets a plus two to con, a speed of 25 feet because they got tiny legs, dark vision of up to 60 feet, resistance to poison damage as well as advantage against being poisoned, proficiency with battle axes, hand axes, light hammers, and war hammers, as well as either smith, brewers, or mason's tools, the common and dwarvish languages, and proficiency and or expertise in knowing where rocks came from. After that, you gotta look deeper into the dwarf by studying its subrace, starting with the mountain dwarf. Mountain dwarves are your archetypical dwarf, spending the most time in, you guessed it, a mountain. This makes them generally a little taller and paler than other dwarves, but other than that, you got yourself a dwarf. Mountain dwarves get a plus two to strength, which is noteworthy in that it's one of the only times that a race gets two plus twos in a stat, and they also get a free proficiency in both light and medium armor. Honestly, the plus two is good, but the mountain dwarves suffer from an identity crisis because all the classes that primarily use strength already have at least medium armor proficiencies, and the classes that don't have them don't need a plus two to strength, so unless you're doing it for the flavor of something, there's a generally better subrace, and that's hill dwarves! Hill dwarves are dwarves that didn't look very high up when choosing their mountain and subsequently set up shop on a hill. They actually build part of their fortresses above ground and then work their way downwards, and they have a generally friendlier attitude towards outsiders due to their less well-defended home. Hill dwarves 
orbs get a plus one to dex, and they get an additional one point of health every level. Considering how stupidly useful dexterity is in 5e, most classes can benefit from getting a plus one to it, and every class always benefits from getting more health, so this is my personal favorite type of dwarf. But there is one more type of dwarf, one that we do not speak of except in soft tongues, and that name be Durger. Durger have a long and complicated history with dwarves, one that I will get into in a different video, but the easiest way to think of them is as dark dwarves the same way that drow are dark elves. Durger get a plus one to strength, a superior dark vision of 120 feet, the ability to speak undercommon as well as the other languages, advantage against being charmed or paralyzed, crazy Durger magic that lets them enlarge themselves and turn invisible, and the same sunlight sensitivity that plagues drow by giving them disadvantage on attacks if either they or their opponent are in direct sunlight. Personally, while the sunlight sensitivity is still a major crutch, if you look at what the Druger have compared to what the other dwarves have, the trade-off is much more fair than with the drow, although again, sunlight sensitivity is still a bitch, so choose it at your own peril. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like and comment if you did, subscribe if you want to be a cool dude, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can slowly make every bit of my life revolve around D&D. Also, if you want to stay up to date on all of your Davy news, I keep a link to my Discord and Twitter in the description below. But yeah, Davy out.